Our scripture reading is our sermon text in the book of Acts, continuing in our series of Acts. Acts chapter 16. Let's turn our hearts to God's Word. Acts 16, beginning in verse, verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her masters by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds and then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them and the whole family was filled with joy because they had come to believe in God. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison, and now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. And then they left. And the Lord bless the reading of his word. One of the greatest disappointments of my Christian life is to see so many of my Christian brothers and sisters lead powerless lives. And this disappointment comes more from knowing what can be than from anything else. You know, the Christian faith has been, through the ages, a rock upon which we rest. Generation after generation have found meaning and purpose in ordinary lives and strength that far outweighs natural ability because of their simple faith and profound faith in Jesus Christ. You know, as Christians, we expect unbelievers to lead lives filled with frustration, meaninglessness, and chasing after the wind. For without Christ, really, this world is meaningless. Without Christ, this world is a truly absurd world. Injustice and insanity reign in our day. But how did we get to the point that so many professing Christians in America today experience the same emptiness the same loneliness, the same disillusionment, and the same materialism so common in the culture around us. Why can we not readily see the power of the gospel radiating from the millions of people in our world, in our country, that call themselves Christians? For the bulk of American Christians, the ancient power of the Christian faith is a legend of history, very far removed from our experience. Christianity is something to be trifled with today, something that may add color to a gray life or something that may help you get through the hard points. But where is the power so obvious in the lives of the early Christians and the prophets before them? Where do we see that in our day, in our culture? It's very difficult to find. It's very difficult 
to see. So when you do run across it, of course, it really stands out from what we see around us. As with all the problems in the life of the Christian discipleship, this problem lies in unbelief and ignorance. The reason so many Christians fail to experience the power of the Christian faith is that they lack faith in the God of the Bible. They can't see the power and so dismiss the biblical gospel, the powerful gospel that we see in our scriptures, as if it really isn't relevant to us in our day. We have it upside down. We are habituated to walk by sight rather than by faith. And here's a case in point, if you think about it. How many of you here realize what kind of power is actually among us today? I mean, to the visible eye, this looks like a regular, regular congregation in an ordinary building on an ordinary Sunday morning in an ordinary little town in America. But is that all that is here this morning? If we see with the eyes of faith, we will recognize that's not all there is to it. I believe that there is much more along the lines of this quote from a Christian author named Annie Dillard. And listen to this quote. This writer really captures what Christians should recognize about the worship of God. Annie Dillard wrote, Why do people in churches seem like cheerful, brainless tourists on a package tour of the absolute? On the whole, I do not find Christians outside the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea of what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does not one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It's madness to wear lady straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews brings back the idea of great power, conditions of worship. It really sums it up. We so little realize here this morning how much power is among us. The Creator, dining with the creation. We so little realize how much power is among us every minute of every day. God living in us and working His will through us. That's why we have stories like this in the book of Acts, in Acts 16. This is a politically radical, earth-shaking, powerful story of liberation. And yet we tend to read this story of the book of Acts in Acts 16 as sort of a little account about some interesting thing that happened in the early church. And it was something that did happen in the early church, but it was much, it was designed and written to accomplish something more than just record history. It's, it's got a prophetic element to it. So I invite you this morning to God's Word in Acts 16 to once again by faith see the power of the Christian faith. Let's go to our text in Acts 16, beginning in verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. Now, our text gives very little background behind this possessed slave girl, but it does clearly show that what was going on here was actually something real, something that was very genuine in her fortune-telling. If you think about it, if her fortune-telling was just a sham there'd be no way that her owners would keep making money and more money over what she was doing. If it was very just a sham and not genuine, then there'd be no reason for people to keep going back to her to have their fortunes told. But actually, this was the case. Now, it might seem strange to us to find Paul having a great consternation about what this spirit-possessed girl was claiming. After all, wasn't this kind of a good thing? Wasn't she telling the truth? Weren't Paul and Silas servants of the Most High God who had come to bring salvation, tell people how to be saved. Well, Paul was troubled not so much by the message of the girl, uh, that the girl spoke, as much as the source from which it came, a spirit or demon of divination. So what troubled Paul was that if the shouting persisted, perhaps a great confusion would come over the people. They would think about what this gospel that Paul is teaching here might be confused as some type of black magic, some type of occultic seance or power or spell. And so, of course, Paul would not accept that the message came, even though the message was true, he would not accept it because it came from a wrong source. 
So he commanded the spirit to come out of her. Now, what's interesting about this is that Paul's not the first one to do this, because if you read back in the early days of Jesus's ministry, something very similar happened to Jesus Christ himself. In Luke 4, we read about this account of Jesus confronting a demon possessed man. We read in Luke 4 that in the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. So both Jesus and Paul realized that preaching the truth was more than just about what was said. It was more than just about content. They both understood that the means or the method of speaking the truth must match with the truth itself. And so they were very concerned about the source of where these things were being said. This demon in Luke 4 was actually claiming the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. You are the Holy One of God. It goes back to the Old Testament. But Jesus wouldn't accept his message because it came from a satanic source. So in both cases, Paul and Jesus demonstrated the binding of Satan by casting out the demons or the spirits. And they, wanted, they really wanted there to be no confusion about the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And really, this is a demonstration of the binding of Satan. And it's interesting in the story of the Bible that until Jesus Christ, you do not have accounts of where God's people or anyone cast out demons. The prophets of old in the Old Testament did many amazing miraculous signs. They performed many miracles of God. They raised the dead. They um, did many different things that Jesus did. But one thing that they did not do in the Old Testament was cast out demons. And this is really a real testimony here to the binding of Satan, the fact that when Jesus came as the Messiah, when he began casting out demons, this is one of the things that was very profound in the Pharisees' mind. He even cast out demons. This was something new to them, something over and above what they were expecting from a prophet. But uh, it really does demonstrate the binding of Satan. But I think at the same time, Christians should not miss the lessons of Paul's actions. There are some methods of evangelism that are incompatible with the gospel itself. Even popular methods. This slave girl was very popular in her culture. And you notice here that Paul doesn't go running to this slave girl and asking to enlist her support in spreading the gospel. He was very careful about that. And if you think about how this relates to, to our American Christian scene today, Christians use all kinds of gimmicks that they engage into to get people into churches. And we call this the church growth movement. I've talked against the church growth movement for many, many, many times. But this is really the same thing that people do with the church growth movement. They'll use any kind of means or method just so long as they can get the gospel content out. And they're not learning here how important the means and the method are as well as the content of the, of the gospel. And it's a very important thing, as we see in our day. So you go into any big church today in America, and you will find a big show with guitars, drums, and multimedia presentations. And we need to recognize something, because there's a means that's being used there and a content that's being uh, transmitted through that means. And we need to make sure that the content and the means are compatible. That's really the issue here between Jesus and Paul. And if it's not uh, guitars and drums and multimedia, it may be incense, icons, and an ornate worship service with you know, formal priests and all kinds of extra things. Of course, these things are very beautiful, but we need to ask ourselves again, is the means of that worship compatible with the content that we're supposed to be doing in worship? So Paul was concerned about the means of his message as much as he was concerned about the content of his message, and we can learn from that. So let's continue our text in verse 19. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone... They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fasten their feet in stocks. There really is a poetic dimension to this account in that the owners of the slave girl was so inconsiderate as to completely overlook the fact that Paul actually helped her. Paul had released her from the power of the Spirit. And they did not obviously have the girl's best interest in mind when they reacted to what Paul and Silas had done. But rather they were concerned only with the loss 
of their money-making arrangement. And that's a little satanic if you think about it because these owners of this slave girl were not really a godly slave owner because a godly slave owner takes and protects and cares for his slave. That's one of some of the rules back in the Old Testament law. But here, it's almost satanic because they had no concern whatsoever over this slave, the slave girl, the fact that she was involved in some type of uh, spirit possession. And now they're taking Paul and Silas to the civil magistrates. It was really, though, the loss of money that got Paul and Silas into trouble, even when their actions made the life of the girl better. And isn't there a lesson in that? Because I dare say that when the gospel in our culture is taught in such a way that it causes certain people to lose certain money, you will find this same very thing happening in our day as well. It's the only logical human response when people believe they are entitled to money derived from the abuse of others. When you get yourself to that point, that satanic point of not caring about individuals and just assuming that you're entitled to money as a result of their existence, it becomes very much like this. And I could give you a lot of different examples of how this works in our culture. I mean, we could actually be here for hours if we talked about how this works in our culture. But I'll give you one example of how a spread of the gospel and the teaching of the gospel, when it cuts into other people's pockets, makes people mad. And that one example, probably one of the more obvious ones, is think about how the education establishment in our country reacts to homeschoolers today. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to the education establishment that children that are homeschooled, on average, do better in school. It doesn't matter that they score better on tests. It doesn't matter that they are better people, have better character traits, have better discipline. It doesn't even matter that they're better workers. What really matters is that each homeschooler costs some government school money. And make no mistake about it, there are many, many people in the educational establishment that are mad about this. And it's this very same thing that, that takes place here when the owners lost the abilities of the slave girl. Notice also that the people in our text appealed to prejudice and tried to mob lynch Paul and Silas. And if you think about that example of what the education establishment does to homeschoolers, you'll see this happening as well because they also appeal to prejudice and try to mob lynch homeschoolers and pass all kinds of laws to regulate or forbid homeschooling. You know, in our text, it's these Jews are causing an uproar in our city. And when it comes to education, you get this basic idea from the education establishment. Those ignorant Christians who homeschool are causing chaos in our public school system. Almost, almost the very same ideas presented. Uh, so we can see how this works. Uh, you also have the example of these Jews are advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. And we'll get to what that means. But you have you know, those homeschoolers out there, they're just violating the compulsory attendance laws and they're breaking the law. Same basic idea. So they use this prejudice and they use the mob lynching concept against homeschoolers. But this happens in a host of different areas of life. If you think about it very long, you'll see how people can really make money off the abuse of others. And when the gospel preaching goes in and starts cutting into the pockets of those who are established, you will find that it makes people mad. It's just a simple fact of life. I should also point out that this example of persecution is entirely different than the persecution that we've seen earlier in the book of Acts. Notice in verse 20, it says, These men are Jews and are advocating customs unlawful for us Romans. And this is the first example here of what is really a Roman persecution more so than a Jewish persecution. If you think back to the early Christians, they were persecuted by the Jews for being Christians. And now Paul and Silas are persecuted by the Romans for being Jews and advocating illegal religious beliefs. So there's a change here. There's something very different, uh, a turning point, so to speak, in the persecution theme that goes through Acts. Now, this idea of the, uh, religious Illegal religious beliefs was termed as the religio lucida under the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And what Rome had done is that they had taken accepted religions in the empire and they had said, you can practice this religion, you can practice this religion, you can practice this religion. It was like a state-authorized religious observance, so to speak. What that we have here is up until this time in Acts, the early Christians weren't persecuted by the Romans because there was very little distinction between Judaism and Christianity. And because Judaism was legal in the Roman Empire, the Romans 
didn't really persecute the Christians up to this point because they just saw that as just a, an aspect of Judaism, you know, some type of internal squabble. And so the Romans didn't bother the Christians from very early on. It was the Jews, and we've seen that through the book of Acts. But it demonstrates a couple things. Of course, obviously, the gospel of Jesus Christ could hardly be distinguished from Judaism up until this point of the book of Acts. And it also demonstrates that this persecution fits in with the outline of Acts from the beginning of Acts. And remember, when we began Acts, I, I gave you um, from the first chapter what is the outline of Acts. And the outline of Acts is that, that Christ sends his disciples from Jerusalem to Judea, Judea into Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And here we have an aspect of Paul and Silas going outside the bounds, so to speak, of the Jewish jurisdiction. You really have this, uh, this going out into the ends of the earth, so to speak, because now we're dealing with Romans as opposed to Jews. And so we have this expansion concept that's at the background behind this new, persecu- new type of persecution. Now, while those things make this account unique in the book of Acts, there is some similarity between the imprisonment of Paul and Silas and one other account of imprisonment earlier in the book of Acts. Peter was also thrown into prison by Herod at the request of the Jews back in Acts 12. And if you remember, there's some interesting parallels between Acts 12 and this. And I don't want to go into the parallels. I'll just mention a couple of them. Peter was also miraculously delivered from prison in the middle of the night, uh, just like Paul and Silas. If you remember back to our time in Acts 12, Peter's escape was really a metaphorical reenactment of Passover. We saw all the language of Passover going, taking place kind of behind the scenes in that escape. And of course, it was right around the, the feast of Passover. Well, this escape here would have profound spiritual implications in poetic senses, much like that one does. And we're going to get to that. But it shows also, and I think this is, this is something we can't miss, it shows also that the believers showed everyone, all the believers that God could deliver his people from the Romans just as surely as he could deliver his people from the Jews. And that was a big thing because in this culture, Roman, the Roman Empire was the ruler of the entire inhabited world. And this was a big step up because it, we're not talking about some podunk Sanhedrin in some corner of the empire. We're talking about now about Rome itself. And you have the deliverance of God's people from Rome. So the lesson would be clear. God is not limited in his power by political jurisdictions. And I also think it's important to point out from this account that we have, and we have many different examples in the New Testament, that Christians in the early church constantly found themselves on the wrong side of the law. It never ceases to amaze me. It never ceases to amaze me how this is nearly universally overlooked by modern Christians in America. Many people in our country think that if someone ends up in prison, it proves that they did something wrong or it proves that they can't be a Christian. After all, we're all taught from very early age that only bad people go to jail. I mean, how often are we taught that? And this culture just sort of, you know, inculcates this idea from very early on. And of course, there are many bad people that end up in jail. That's obviously a fact of life. But we tend to think of a good Christian as one who never is at odds with the law, but is that what we see in Scripture? No, actually, it's just the opposite. You know, there was not one apostle that did not find himself in prison, exile, or executed for violating the law of the land. In fact, the devout Christians were the ones that were willing to go to jail for what they believed. They were the ones willing to, to, to reject the laws of Rome when it came to the presentation of their gospel. Well, why did they end up there? Why did they end up in prison? Because with their entire being, they believed that Jesus Christ was king over all kings and lord over all lords, and that included Caesar. That was the real infraction of the early Christians. And we'll get to that here because in Acts 17 it gets more explicit. And this theme of Roman persecution actually kind of picks up. The Jews are still involved and we'll see how they are involved, but it definitely comes from this point on to have more of a Roman flavor than a Jewish flavor. But the early Christians believed that Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, had all authority in heaven and on earth. They believed there was another king, there, there was another king besides Caesar. And they believed there was another kingdom besides Rome. And this wasn't just a trite slogan for them. I mean, we have this sloganized Christianity, you know, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and everybody raises their hands and sings and feels really good about it. That wasn't what this was about. They really believed this. And they put their belief into action. Now, I know that there are many out there that we deal with on a fairly regular basis that are very uncomfortable with the facts of the early church history and the bumpy relationship the Christians had with the law. And of course, people still, many, many parts of the world, and even in America in some points, 
Christians still have a bumpy relationship with the law. Even Jesus, what we have to remember from the very beginning of our faith, even Jesus himself was executed by the lawful authorities. That's something that is so profound to think about, that our Lord and Savior himself was executed by legal authorities. So some will ignore this mountain of examples and say, well, what about Romans 13? And of course, Romans 13, to so many people, says, obey the government. That's, what, that's all it says. And they'll go on, they'll, they'll ignore this entire mountain of evidence about how the Christians related to the lawful authorities of their day and what they did. And they'll say, just from Romans, just read Romans 13, that's it. And of course, that simplistic approach to Romans 13, among other things, it, it overlooks the fact that Paul was himself sitting in jail at the time for violating the Roman law when he wrote Romans 13. But it overlooks a very important fact about Romans 13 that Paul calls governors or authorities ministers of God. And I think that's one of the most important aspects of Romans 13 because that language is very important. Paul uses the same word used there for Christian ministers in other parts of the New Testament. And those, of course, were who had charges of shepherding the church, ministers of God. Well, Paul uses that in reference to authorities. Now, Christians rightly recognize that we are to obey the leaders of our church. Okay? This is how I'm going to present this idea to you so maybe you can argue this a little better. When someone says Romans 13, what you should say is what about Hebrews 13? Because Hebrews 13 says obey your leaders, speaking of the church. And Christians in our day recognize right off the bat, most of them, the conservative Bible-believing ones, recognize that if there are leaders in your church who begin preaching anti-biblical things, who, be, who set themselves against the gospel and do unbiblical things, you have no obligation to stay in that congregation and that you're supposed to separate yourself from that, find another body, worship with another body that's faithful. So if that's the case with ministers in Hebrews 13, it should obviously be the case on the same order when it comes to Romans 13. The same is true of government ministers that violate God's standards of justice and government and become anti-Christian. Their authority at bottom is not their own. And this is the important thing. All authority is Christ. All authority is derived from Christ. And so when govern, government, whether it's in a congregation or whether it's in the, the, Rome, the civil sphere or whatever, when it sets itself against Christ and against his gospel, it has no authority. Paul recognizes this right here. And we'll see later in Acts 17 and, and from, from here on out, many, many years of Paul's life, or actually spent in jail for preaching the gospel, for teaching uh, Jesus Christ. So Paul knew the full gospel of Christianity was against the Roman laws, and he taught and lived the gospel anyway. It's a lesson that we should learn and should not forget. Verse 22, The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. Now there is really something remarkable about, remarkable about the account of Paul and Silas in prison. How in the world could they receive a beating, be put in jail, all for doing good, and then be singing God's praises and praying to God till midnight? How in the world is that humanly possible? They may have even been singing some of the same psalms that we sang this morning. But where is the anger? Where is the self-pity? Where is the depression? Where is the panic? You don't see it here with Paul and Silas. This is a remarkable account that gives evidence of the power of their Christian faith. And what I'm going to suggest to you here about this account is that it's even more powerful if you consider it as a metaphorical picture as well as accurate history. There is a poetic dimension here. In the Bible, prisons are often used as images for sin and death. Those who are prisoners are those who are bound by sin and death. So Jesus, when he begins his ministry in Luke 4, says he came to, quoting the prophet Isaiah, proclaim freedom for the prisoners 
So if you let that biblical image illuminate this account, it becomes, it becomes a beautiful story of the gospel itself. Here's Paul and Silas and others, God's own children bound and stashed in the innermost part of the prison with the gates around them, being held in prison, bound with iron chains. And what happens? God comes down in response to their prayers and shakes the very foundation of the jail. Paul and Silas couldn't beat the prison on their own. They were stuck. And yet God comes down and actually shakes the earth itself, breaking the foundation of the prison and, and swinging the doors open and the chains off their hands. And this is really an account that would testify to the power of the Christian faith in the life of the early believers. And I'll make a connection here that probably not many of you would think about, but when Peter gave his confession before Christ, Christ said something very powerful to Peter. And I believe it connects to this concept of the prison. When Peter gave his confession to Christ, Jesus responded by saying, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail over it. And it's interesting because other translations actually translate that sometimes a little differently. The gates of hell will not prevail over it. But actually, the Greek word there is not Gehenna. It's actually Hades. And, and, and I think it's important to keep in our translation those words separate and distinct. But some explain that passage, that promise to Peter, as if you have the church on the march throughout history, and wherever the church goes through history, it's breaking down strongholds of evil and darkness. And it's a victorious concept. And I do believe in a victorious church through history. I believe we have the power to tear down strongholds, to, to actually have the gospel expand. But I, I, I believe that considering the fact that the Greek word in the passage is Hades or death, and considering the gates of death come up in many other passages of Scripture, like passages like Job 38 and Psalm 9 and Isaiah 38, I believe Jesus' promise is better understood in the specific sense of the word used. Against the church, the gates of death will not prevail. Death is binding man. This is the concept of the gospel. Man fell in his sin and, and was bound by death. And the gospel is that God comes down, shakes the earth, just like this earthquake, shakes the earth and releases the prisoners from their bonds. And that's exactly what's happening in our text in a poetic sense. Paul and Silas and the others are sitting in prison, surrounding by the gates of death, as it were. And before this, they're the property of Rome, property of the strong man, so to speak. And here you have God invading history, shaking the foundations and releasing the prisoners. It's a symbol of God's victory over the very reality of death itself for all those who believe. And that's really what it comes down to. If you look at this story in, in, in terms of all the biblical examples of the gates of death that happen in the Old Testament, the promise of Jesus in Matthew 16, and the whole concept of, of the defeat of death of which Jesus Christ, who brought life, it actually fits. And this is where the ultimate power of the Christian faith comes from. The ultimate power of the Christian faith is not the impact it has on politics. The ultimate power of the Christian faith is not the impact it has on families. It's not the impact that it has on cultures or churches. All of these things have power, but the ultimate power of the Christian faith is more fundamental than any of those things. There is something more fundamental to the power of the Christian faith, and that power is bound up in the reality that Christ has defeated death for those who believe. And these men knew this. This is what explains that they can sit there in this prison, in this dark prison, of course there's no lights, and sing psalms from memory and pray and be an encouragement to everyone else that's there. And we really don't know if there are other Christians there or if there was just them or if there was other people already in the jail. But the fact is, that's what explains their actions. These men knew that there was nothing that could be done to them that would ultimately hurt them. They had no fear of death and that's why they could take the abuse, sit in prison and still sing God's praises and lift their hearts. And this is the logic of it. They understood that this suffering that they were going through, which was real suffering, real pain, real trauma, was temporary and it was small in comparison to the eternal life that they had in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ had been risen from the dead. He had broken this prison. And they knew that power was at work inside of them. 
Now imagine how your life would experience the power of God if you put this fact of the Christian faith in practice. How would your life change if you realized by faith that you will never die? Christians don't talk about that very much. If you believe, you will never die. How does that change everything about you? What you do, what you plan, it changes everything if you actually put it to practice in faith. Or here's a good one. How would it change you if you knew that none of your family members or loved ones who believed in Jesus could ever ever die? And as a father who loves my children, as a husband that loves my wife, of course, that's something those, those worrying thoughts come. What happens to one of my children? This liberates you from that because you can know by faith that your children will never die through faith. Your wife, your husband can never die through faith. It doesn't matter what men do to you or how many enemies set themselves against you or your family because of your stand for the gospel. You can believe that you will never die. And I am absolutely convinced that Christians do not even understand how radical this statement of Jesus was. Back at the resurrection of Lazarus, Jesus says, He who believes in me will never die. And then he asked Martha or Mary, I can't remember who it was, do you believe this? Well, do we believe this? Well, these men believed it. And that's why they could do what they do. That's, wh- that's what they, why they could stand up against Rome. They could go anywhere. They could preach fearlessly. And it didn't matter. Because they knew that they had eternal life. All power in the Christian life ultimately comes from the headwaters of this profound truth. And I really do believe that Christians in our country miss this basic idea, which is the doctrine of the eternal life that we have in Jesus Christ. He came to bring life. He came to bridge so his people would never die. And all these, all these actions are inexplicable apart from that world-conquering power that this faith imparts. If you look back through the history of the church, too, you'll see this theme coming up whenever there have been great forward movements in the history of the church. Athanasius, Augustine, the Reformation, and numerous other points in history. You'll have this at the very top of the list when you're reading the church fathers, when you're reading various different things, they knew that nothing that men could do to them could ever hurt them. And that was the boldness that they lived. Continue in verse 29. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. When they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house, At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into the house and set a meal before them, and the whole family was filled with joy because they had come to believe in God. Perhaps the jailer's gratitude could be understandable if you you realize that in Roman law, an officer that allows the escape of his prisoner is given the punishment due to that prisoner. And so right away here, we see that probably one of the aspects of the punishment that the magistrates had in mind was death for Paul and Silas. And this was really a serious situation for the jailer. If all the prisoners were gone, all the punishments would be given to him. And you can imagine how he felt once he realized that his life was spared. And of course, the, Paul and Silas knew that for the gospel's sake, it wouldn't behoove the gospel of the kingdom to just flee. They knew something very, very miraculous had happened. Here they... They're in in prison and they pray and they sing psalms and we have this immediate reaction of an earthquake, God's shaking of the earth. And by the way, this earthquake here, I believe, fits into the overall story of the Bible as well because Jesus predicted earthquakes for the generation of the disciples. And the interesting thing about the first century is that there were many earthquakes, many devastating earthquakes. Colossae was ruined by an earthquake. Bo talked about a, a, a town last week that was ruined by an earthquake. Of course, you've got more famous earthquakes like Pompeii and Vesuvius' eruption. And this really does kind of fit in the story because Jesus told them earthquakes were coming. But this is miraculous in the sense that it's immediate upon the prayers of Paul and Silas. But notice here that there is necessary, it is necessary to do something in order to be saved. And I say this very carefully because our heritage as Protestants rightly stresses the overarching aspect of grace in salvation. But Paul doesn't correct the question of the jailer. The jailer asks, what must I do to be saved? Rather, what he does, he gives a simple answer. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. 
There's that household concept again in the book of Acts. The Christians today think everybody gets saved just as individuals. If you just say the prayer or you know the four spiritual laws or you walk the aisle and you know make a, make a profession, you're just saved as an individual. Well, there's more to it than that. You have this uh, household salvation. But we should recognize that grace and works are not incompatible in our salvation. Grace is not opposed to works, even if it, that work is a simple aspect of believing. That's not opposed to grace. We should understand that grace is opposed to merit. This jailer couldn't merit anything from Paul and Silas. He was in a very a near-death experience. What could he do to place a claim on Paul and Silas? Absolutely nothing. So he didn't merit anything, but he did something that was necessary in his salvation. He believed. And we notice here that he also completed that faith by his works. Because he goes immediately, he washes their wounds, he's baptized, he goes and he, he sets a meal before them, and so you have this fellowship of this early Christian community. And actually you find out later in some of the epistles that this jailer is Stephanus, who was a, was a leader in the early church at Philippi and Corinth. So this is a story that actually comes up in later places in the New Testament. Verse 35, When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, Release those men. The jailer told Paul, The magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison, and now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Then they left. So our text this morning ends with Paul being his normal feisty self. He did not let the authorities get away with the injustice of beatings and imprisonment without a trial. He didn't let them get off scot-free. And this is where the culture is important because as a Roman citizen, he had a legal right to a a fair trial before he was punished. And what the authorities had actually done to him was actually a form of treason against Rome because what they had done was they had violated Rome's law themselves in, in doing this to Paul and Silas. There had been no trial, and so these authorities would have been in very hot water if Paul had wanted to notify Rome of their abuse. Now, many people simplistically believe that Christians have to take whatever the world dishes out. And this is an aspect of our feministic and very wimpy Christianity in our day. And by that logic... Paul was wrong here in standing on his rights, standing on his law as a Roman citizen. But I think this account really just proves how wrong that idea that you know, Christians just have to take whatever, they can't resist against anything, you know, they just have to take the abuse and move on and you know, live for the next world. Well, Paul didn't do that. The important thing to realize is that God hates injustice. And if God hates injustice, we should too. And... There may become points in time where we can't necessarily resist bad things that people do to us. They may have more power than we have. And in that case, we can, we can suffer through it knowing what these, knew, what these men knew when they were suffering through their uh, persecution. But that should never happen without our resistance on whatever legal ground is available to us. And Paul actually stood up for his rights and forced a public apology. And he got the people to actually, the leaders to actually come out and escort them out of the prison. And that was a sign of honor and respect. And there was a reason he did that. You, know, you can read this simplistic and think it was just for his own ego. I mean, he's just, he just got burned. He wants to, you know, put it to him, get some revenge. But actually, if you think about it, he knew that there was going to be a congregation in this, in this town. And he was going to use what they had done to him to develop a relationship here that would give the benefit to the early Christians who lived in Philippi. Because these rulers, once they had done this to Paul, they would be very careful about what they did with the Christians from here on out, at least for a time. And they knew, of course, that Paul could at any time go talk to Rome and they would be in very hot water. And so this is not a selfish thing by Paul. He's using his legal standing for the benefit of God's kingdom. And that's, that's a real important principle that you can think about. It It has a great deal of many implications. Using the legal standing that you have to benefit the kingdom 
Uh, that was really what he was doing here. It wasn't a selfish thing. Well, accounts like these and acts can refresh our faith and restore the power God has bestowed to us in Jesus Christ. So my only thing to you is to cherish these accounts. Teach these accounts to your children. Learn from them. They place our feet back on the firm ground of wisdom in a world that is becoming more bizarre every day. Recognize the big picture of the gospel is about eternal life. At bottom, that is the heart of the gospel. Everything else flows from that. Everything else is an aspect of that life flowing out in us. Jesus summed it up in his teaching and in his life. Fear not him who can kill the body. Fear him who can kill both body and soul and heaven. Let's pray.